What's going on, everybody? My name is Daniel Magyar, and I am here with my very, very good friends and guests in my country, Slovakia. The reason why we all got together is because of a carnivore seminar in Eastern Europe that I hosted with my business partner, Milan Balkovic. And I truly believe that it turned out to be a successful event. And I invited Dr. Sean Baker and Dr. John Jaitwish to be speakers at my event. I personally had a wonderful time and I can't thank you enough to come all the way from the United States to Eastern Europe to spread the message and share your knowledge. People loved you. They loved hanging out with you. Um, I appreciate that you took your time and walked around the crowd and gave yourself to the people so they can take pictures and ask personal questions. It means the world to me that you took care of my people like that. Like your heart was really, really amazing. And I really get to, uh, I really got to hang out with you guys. Of course, John, we've been knowing each other for years, but Sean, with you, this was my first <coughs> opportunity to meet you in person and actually hang out with you and train with you and have personal conversations mm. and just spend every single day and dinners together. And uh, I am, uh, I am very, very excited. I got the chance and. You're a really funny guy, that's one thing, that's for sure. You are really, really sticking to everything that you're preaching. Like, you're a very, very strict person about your diet. Um, i never seen you cheat, and you genuinely didn't want to. Uh, you're a really strong person, <laughs> that's for sure. From the experience of working out with you, you have a power of definitely more power than me. And uh, now I'd like to know, how did you guys enjoy it here? Well, I, you know, John showed me a video from a movie he was excited about called Euro Trip about Bratislava. I was kind of disappointed because it didn't live up to the movie. And the movie shows like a bombed out, you know, depressed place. But actually, Bratislava was wonderful. We were super excited to be here. Uh, like you said, I was in incredibly impressed by what was put on, what you guys, you and your partner put on. It was an outstanding event. The people were so wonderful. Uh, you know, it was it was deeply motivating to see the number of people whose lives have been touched you know on the other side of the world for for all intents and purposes from my perspective yeah so that was that was amazing it was really good i i, I you know i just as much as you're happy to have us i'm very thankful <laughs> to, to have been invited here and uh and, and honored to to be able to have a chance to speak to everyone same the the conference was amazing brightest love is beautiful like like that one clip in that one movie just made it look like you know like a kind of a questionable place uh it's gorgeous it's like a european city that hasn't been screwed up yet because uh, a lot of european cities are pretty screwed up you know like i, I was in milan a couple of years ago and they'll bulldoze 200 300 year old buildings and then put up some aluminum and glass shoebox type building that looks you know sort of like a sewage treatment plant and uh i don't know why they do that i think they're ruining that city uh but there's none of that in bratislava they keep they keep the old buildings in great order and it's gorgeous the countryside's great and the people are great I, it's just been such an awesome experience very happy to hear that guys so yesterday, we also took a trip to Budapest mm. to meet with some other carnivore experts and scientists, which I found to be very <coughs> knowledgeable and informative. Yeah. And I had a really good time in Budapest. But we also, before the meeting, we had like six hours for ourselves. And we just walked the entire city, yeah. <laughs> like 10 miles across the entire city. We went up to the main castle and we had a, you know, overlook and we probably experienced the best view in Budapest. So what did you guys, what, what did you guys think about that place? Well, Budapest, Budapest was absolutely amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad we, we got to go there. We kind of, you know, because we weren't sure we we're going to go, and we said, let's just go do that. And uh, um, wow, talk about a historic city. Talk about just spectacular architecture. And, and uh, yeah, you know, like I said, John and I both live in the United States. We don't have these things in the United States. You know, a lot of people in Europe take take for granted some of these cities. But it's, I would, you know, and I've been all over Europe, and I would wager that Budapest is probably one of the nicest most impressive cities in, in the entire uh, yeah. entire entire entirety of europe so that was neat um one day was certainly not enough you know or if we come back next year uh, which hopefully we will uh, I, i'll probably set aside at least a couple of days to to go check that out and uh 
uh, you know, we had that nice dinner with you, you mentioned some friends. <coughs> I was I was I was a little curious because I remember the fellow from Transylvania. I'm not sure I saw a shadow on him, so <laughs> might quest- be a vampire. Qu- questionably vampiric. We have to ring bring uh, mm-hmm. ring mirrors next time. No, no I'm kidding. I'm Lorik is his name. No, I, he was a good guy. It was wonderful, cool. wonderful guy. Yeah. Um, and I continue to be amazed at the people from all around the world. How generous and kind, and uh, you know, uh, so you know, obviously. The messages that we've been able to share have been, had a positive impact, and we're, we're seeing it, it being returned by the kindness we've received. I think the best part about this entire experience, in Eastern Europe, there's no politics in nutrition, whereas there's a lot of politics in nutrition in the States. So you, you talk to people, yeah, the perfect human diet is really just animal protein and water. And they listen to you for a little bit and you talk about some studies and they say, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, nobody said that before. I really like it. Whereas in the United States, you go to a, a group that hasn't heard of carnivore nutrition or hasn't, hasn't been following and you say, yeah, my, you know, my diet's basically meat and water. And they look at you like you're absolutely crazy. Like I, I, the first in disbelief, like there's no way. And then they're like, well, you know, you're clearly going to have a heart attack and, you know, they got to they got a double chin and they're telling you <laughs> you're gonna yeah. have a heart attack and you're like you you sure you mean me like that like i just don't like they don't put it together because they've been so indoctrinated in the states by just incorrect information uh not here gotcha. which is great yeah so i love that you guys had this kind of experience now one more thing that i would say is that it's actually a very safe place to visit yeah. Regardless of what's going on in the world in Ukraine and Russia, <laughs> did you guys feel safe? No, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, we're both we're all big human beings. So I generally don't feel unsafe, but I, there was not even a second where I was even remotely concerned about, you know, my safety. Or, you know, if, even if I was a small woman, I don't think I would feel particularly concerned. I mean, it, you know, it, it looked looked and felt very, very, very safe, and uh, yeah, I, I didn't see any problems at all. Yeah, I brought my wife in. She is a small woman, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, she said, I feel safer walking around both Bratislava and Budapest. Um, like, there were like 14, 15 year old females walking around both cities, like, with by themselves, like, they were going to wherever they were going, getting on and off subways or, or just walking, and no one had any sort of safety concern, and they were sort of all over the place. You can't do that in a big city in the United States. Like, apparently, the police actually do police work here, whereas in the States, they're told not to. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm very happy that you, you had this experience because it's important to point out that, you know, the Russia Ukraine war, which is disastrous and it's very sad that's happening, doesn't really have an impact. On a on a states and a country that's part of the European Union, right. because a lot of people in the United States might be concerned they don't want to go to Europe or Eastern Europe because there's this Russia Ukraine conflict going on. But actually, when you're here with your feet, experiencing the reality of the mm-hmm. country that's part of the European Union, it actually doesn't affect it. Like you're very safe, and there's no harm going on, and nobody's trying to steal from you, rob you. Nothing. That's what I love about my country. It's really one of the safest places. So now. What was very, very surprising to me, Sean, um, hanging out with you for the first time, is how little you eat, actually. <laughs> like you don't eat, really eat that much. You eat a couple eggs in the morning, and you eat a couple of steaks at night. But uh, I know you mentioned also that your training intens- intensity is not as high as back in the States, and you're also trying to lean out at the same time. So is that, is that why you keep your food consumption at, at the lower side? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit. There's a couple things. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all of that. I, I'm, I am trying to reduce some weight. Uh, I'm not training quite as, 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 as much as I normally would. Uh, even though we did a lot of walking. I mean, what, what are we, what, 25,000 25, steps yesterday. or something like that. But the other thing is, you know, my, my eating schedule is kind of backwards because we're going out to eat at night. I generally prefer not to eat a lot of food at night just mm-hmm. because it, it, it tends to interrupt, with, interrupt my sleep a little bit. You know, and, and not to mention the fact that we're on – you know, I think we're on 10 hours time zone difference or something like that. So dealing with the time zone. Um, I mean, my typical amount of food that I eat at home is going to be three to four pounds. So, you know, one and a half to two kilos a day, which is, 
I'm not, you know, I'd say I'm I'm probably about seventy percent of that over here, something like that, which is yes. about which about makes sense. And you know, like I said, if I was at home with my normal routine, my normal training schedule, um, and maybe not walking so much, you know, um, I would tend to eat probably a little more than I am now. John, what do you think difference in a, in a food quality here? And a food quality in in the United States based on the state houses and the places that we went to. Did you notice any difference or is, is meat is Well, meat? nobody's cooking with vegetable oil. Like I, I I can taste it. Like when there's vegetable oil and there's not, just because I try to avoid it. Um <laughs> there's so I, I feel like the restaurant food quality is better here. Uh the meats have all been great. Um uh, it's it's funny like the less you mess with an animal from a from a business perspective to try and get more meat out of one animal which is what we do in the united states uh really the better it turns out so um it's it's like it's almost like we kind of went back in time a little bit and we just have better quality food um so i've been i've been thrilled also i think sean's been eating a little more than you've noticed <laughs> I've never. The, the reason I say that is room. because I've never seen anybody eat at the speed that you eat. Like <laughs> he had like three plates of eggs this morning and maybe like two or three large bowls of yogurt. Okay. And they just vanished. And and like you and I were talking, he had I don't know four or five <laughs> like plates of food, and we're just like talking. Gotcha. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So, so today. Um, Today I missed the breakfast, like majority of the breakfast, because I mm -hmm. had to return the vehicle. Yeah, but that's why I probably missed a couple of plates of the eggs before I got there. Yeah, you did. Yeah. So yeah, it's just uh, to me it was like you know my first impression of you when I saw you is is being surprised how big in person you actually are, and to support that all of that musculature and and body with uh, such a little food as I saw. I mean, that's pretty impressive because you do no supplements, like none of that stuff. So it's just pure food, like really good beef and good eggs and absolutely no junk into it. And I was su surprised that you can support that type of a musculature and the strength. Like you did like 500 pounds of, of deadlift for the 10 reps, um, which is crazy to think about, first mm. of all. And then second Especially of all, at your height. Yeah. Mm. And then second of all, it supported by the food and, and as far as i <coughs> saw i'm like wow that's actually impressive how you can support that with the less food than i would expect yeah, yeah well like, like i said there's a difference between trying to gain and trying to not and trying to actually lose a little bit so so i mean if i'm trying to gain weight i'm eating five six pounds a day which is gotcha. which is probably you know also keep in mind we we were all lied to and probably the most saboteurish piece of information in fitness especially in strength sports is that you need to eat big to get big no you don't you need to eat a little bit more of quality uh which is uh, you know high, high protein and the proper amount of fat but that doesn't mean you need to just be gorging yourself like that and i think the whole like bulking and cutting thing that came about in I think like 70s and 80s because bodybuilders are trying to cover for their steroid cycles so they just sort of made that up like oh yeah I'm gonna eat a lot and I'll put on a lot of muscle really they might might have been eating more and gotten a little sloppy about it but they didn't want people to really notice like how quickly they were getting bigger so it was like, oh, it's the food. Like I, you know, I eat a ton of food, and it's just like, no, you don't. It's it's something else. So I, I think that that I, I've always seen that piece of advice is really lame, and uh, I I don't know, just just deductive reasoning came up with. I, I think that's w where it originated from. It was sort of like you know, like. Uh, I won't mention names, but there's a pretty famous actor that says he eats 10,000 calories a day, and it's like, you know, pounds of cod and stacks of pancakes, and it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> like, that's just absolutely untrue. I think I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think everybody's seen that. And he's really just trying to distract from the fact that uh, there might be some performance-enhancing drugs in there. So 
like you said, eat bait to get bait. One of the worst advices I could have ever gotten as a kid because I took the, I took it completely the wrong way. And also, people made it about calories. It's not like I gain muscle when I'm at a protein surplus and a calorie deficit. Now, I gain muscle when I'm at a calorie surplus also, and I I feel like there are days where I'll go into a small surplus because I choose fattier meats and I might eat more than one meal in a day. Uh, so like when I'm in the States, like on the weekends, it's lots of eggs. Like I might eat, I don't know, 20 eggs in a day. Uh, and then like two pounds of ribeye or something like that. Like that's, that's like a perfect Saturday for me. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and the, but then on the weekdays, it's Fortigen, which gives me 150 grams of protein because I take three servings of it. Um, you know, with very little calories, uh, there's like four calories per serving because it's only fractions of what would be considered measurable food. So the FDA determines, you know, that's, that's not really calories. <clears throat> uh, but, and then, you know, at the end of the day, I might have a pound or two, uh, or a pound and a half or two of like something leaner, like a New York steak or a sirloin or something like that. And which is protein s- surplus, calorie deficit. I still gain muscle, but you just, you don't, the idea that you need to like turn into a fat slob while you're gaining muscle is just like not true. One of the worst advices I've ever gotten was you got to eat big to get big because I took yeah. it completely the wrong way as a kid. There was no carnivore like 12, 13 years ago when I was a kid because I'm 30 now. <laughs> And I was just binging on junk food. Jesus Christ, I got fat and puffy and ugly. It was literally ugly. And that's what I thought I need to do to put on the size. And then I needed to lose all that weight. And then you're playing a game of getting fat and losing weight, and you never look good. No, like, there's you're never struggling. That in, how about the, the metabolic implications of that? Like, how, how damaging is it to get fat and then have to fight to drop that and like sean the uh, we were talking about how some of the people who get obese yeah they can lose the weight their their health is still compromised long term tell us more about like, it yeah yeah i mean explain yeah, well, like some mean, of the some well, like the I mean, we three four hundred pounders yeah that, we were talking about uh, you know there's a, a, a fellow that uh, had the record for the world longest fast he fasted from i think something around 380 days uh, Scottish guy, I can't remember, Angus something or another, and he uh, went from like 400 pounds to 180. He lost the weight by not eating for a year or a little over a year, um, but he still died quite early. He's, he died quite young from, from cardiovascular disease, as, as I understand it. And I think, I think you know, getting that big, even if you lose a weight, has has long lasting effects on you. There's damage that's occurring, and and you know that that will that will catch up with you at some point. So there's no. There, as you mentioned, and I did the same thing when I was younger. It was just eat, 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 put on as much weight as possible, get above 300 pounds, um, and and you know I'm sure I, I caused myself some some damage long term. And, and I think, like I said, as we know now, I mean, again, it's hindsight is always better. But we know that you know if you're going to to, to gain a small a small surplus is 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 generally sufficient to put. What on is small surplus? Well, I mean, most people would suggest somewhere between, you know. 15, 10, 15, maybe as much as 20% over your, your maintenance, uh, maintenance amount of food. So somewhere in that neighborhood. So that's how I, how you would estimate the active calories. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to put it in those terms, yes. You, you know, if you're, if, if you're in a long-term, you know, maintenance phase and you have a pretty good idea of what you normally do day to day, again, most people, it's hard because most people don't have a consistent diet day in and day out. But if you do, you know where you're at and you say, Hey, look, now it's time for me to put on five pounds. I want I want to put on five pounds over the next six months or a year, whatever. It depends how far along you are. Then you can say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ratchet things up. You know, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty percent maybe, uh, and then and then go from there. And I think that will be most likely to yield you what you want because we don't want a lot of fat gain. You know, you know, it's it's hard once you gain the fat. It's hard to get it off. As you mentioned, ten, fifteen, twenty percent. To someone like me with the panda genetics, which means that if I don't watch my diet, I look like a panda. No difference at all. 20% to me is on the higher side. And if I was about to increase my calories above my maintenance, 
for the weight gain purposes, which I'll probably never ever do again in my life because I'm not really interested in gaining more weight. Yeah. It's all about shreds and shreds and as low body fat as possible for me from this point on. I would probably start very, very lightly above what I burn, even as little as 100 to 200 calories above just to watch the response because you might just blow up where your measurements and calculations just are not accurate and they just don't yeah. work the way you're, you're predicting them to work so it is very possible that i would go two three hundred calories above my maintenance and i would blow up four to five pounds within two or three days that's just way too much water retention and i know that i'm just stepping into this weight gain and phase way too aggressive uh, aggressively so regardless of what the calculations say they're not accurate um th that can happen that you're not going to hit every single calorie exactly how you think you're going to hit it what do you think about it john about all this calorie thing well, it's the grams of protein that matter more. Uh, and like, uh, grams of protein are, are going to determine <clears throat> how much muscle protein synthesis and general cellular repair. Like, we need protein for everything that's going on. Uh, fats are also required. Like, you know, just the, you feel oil on your hands, you know, your hair, your nails. Um, every cell in your body needs those fats. Uh, there's nothing that needs carbohydrates. Nothing. So, Absolutely. yeah, so I, I think as long as, and for me, I can, the way I'm, the way I do it, it I, I try and keep everything consistent from day to day because the more you make things a routine, the less likely you are to screw it up. So, like, most people don't forget for a month to brush their teeth, right? You just wake up and do it. They don't forget to put their pants on because they just do it. It's part of their routine. Uh, if you make nutrition part of your routine, I have a slightly different routine on a weekend day than I do on a weekday. Uh, What's the difference? You just eat more? Yeah, weekends, it's it's like ribeyes and eggs. And weekdays, it's uh, you know kind of fish and sirloin and uh, New York's. So I think we need to highlight that weekends are still a carnivore diet and you're still yeah, everything's to Yeah, everything's carnivore. Right, right, because sometimes, you know, people yeah. might get excited. On the weekends, I did a break. I can do cheesecake and stuff like that. And it's like funny. That, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. every experiment that I've tried, like, there's the literature, and the literature does not look at carbohydrates favorably. Uh, you know, there's, there's really no, <laughs> no purpose uh, except... In practice, some, especially bodybuilders, they'll sort of throw the curveball. Well, what about muscle glycogen? I want to. I want muscles to feel full. I want them sticking out and, you know, rounded. Um, the higher fat days give me that effect. Mm -hmm. So, like that's like on the weekends. I know when when uh, my, my wife will notice. Like on the weekdays, I look great. On the weekends, she just you're like I feel like you put on like five pounds of muscle since like yesterday and uh you know it's like what 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 did my day look like i might have had 20 eggs for breakfast i had uh because i'll eat more than one meal on the weekends too so <clears throat> much more freedom and then you know maybe like a 40 ounce rib eye at night and uh it's yeah. plenty of calories right there yeah fortunately i don't have the the sleep issue or at least not that i'm aware of uh but also, when you're married and you eat with your wife, that, that was kind of a curveball about marriage I didn't see coming. Uh, yeah, you, you, you're not really running your own schedule all the time. Uh, gotcha. there's, another, there's another person that uh, seems like a saboteur, but just somebody else with a different opinion. Uh, so you got to reconcile there. Sean, how would you approach getting absolutely shredded like let's imagine you're trying to get as low body fat as possible and also preserve muscle at the same time mm. what would be your approach well i mean i think the second part of that question is the most valuable is, is preserving the muscle because uh you know a 150 pound dude with a six pack is you know a dime a dozen quite honestly i mean it's harder to do that when you're you know you've got some decent muscle in there so obviously keeping adequate protein in the diet what I is the adequate protein you know, well, I mean, you know, if you look at the current literature, you know, people would say anywhere between one two to one six per kilo, maybe as high as two six per kilo, two point six grams per kilo. Um, I think that's 
in carnivore, it might even be higher, quite honestly, because you know we're, we're we're not including carbohydrates in the diet. We don't we don't really have any good studies on that yet. Hopefully, those are those will be forthcoming. Um, the other thing is that uh, you know the, the the training is 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 incredibly important. I mean, that's obviously you can't you know you cannot not train if you don't give your body stimulus to to say hang on to the muscle. It's not going to keep it in a deficit. So you know if you go into uh, reduced energy deficit, you know, whether it's, and, and John mentioned carbohydrates, you know, again, talking outside the world of carnivorous diets, uh, people need energy, you know, and you can get it from fat, you can get it from carbohydrates. Again, you have to have fat in your diet. You do not have to have carbohydrates in your diet. But if your choice of energy is carbohydrates because you like the way they taste, because they're convenient, they're more predictable for a uh, rapid onset of, of, of uh, glycogen and glucose, you're familiar with it. A lot of people are comfortable with that. You know, you you absolutely don't need to do that. You can you can do it on fat. Um, but you know, and again, I think this is a, this is a, the interesting thing within within the carnivore community is a lot of people will say, well, you know, I I can take an obese person, I can have them losing weight by eating lots of fat, and you know you know some amount of protein. But when we're talking about getting shredded, then I think you have to be very meticulous. You have to be someone who's going to be very conscious of how much you eat you're going to experience some hunger i think i think that's inevitable hopefully it's not you know I, i've talked to a lot of people that have done bodybuilding cuts on carnivore versus other uh, scenarios and they will say that almost without exception the carnivorous route was the easiest route for them to get shredded without the you know the the, the hormonal issues the hunger issues uh, you know just the misery that they often sustain so also it's much muscle more loss well, yeah, I mean, some degree muscle loss, but I mean, again, that, that can be mitigated again by training. And well, I mean, I think the days of eating 800 calories, like, are, are, are just hopefully beyond, you know, behind everybody. I mean, it's like now you get into, again, talking to the average person, maybe they're down 1,800 calories, 2,000 calories, um, you know, for a, for a male, maybe something along those lines. So I think that's. That's how you do it. Now, now, again, I'm not a bodybuilder. That's not my goal. Uh, my, my goal is more, more, more uh, performance-based. But I, I did get pretty lean a few years back. And what, the way I did it was basically through um, uh, what I called fat cycling. And so basically I would have several days where I would eat quite lean, right? So I would eat. How often? How many times a day would you eat and how much? Well, um, I would eat two to three times a day. Um, and I can't remember the exact amounts at the time. But I mean, it was. Would you measure? Um, in a way, I mean, I wouldn't weigh it on a scale. I mean, I, because for me, I mean, I know what I normally eat, and I know, and it's pretty easy to say I'm eating less than I normally eat. So I would just, and I would reduce day over day. But I was just like, well, what does I eat last week? I'll eat a little, a little bit less this next week, and uh, it was, it was, it was higher uh, protein dense food. It was, it was the leaner cuts of beef. It was some fish. It was some chicken. I don't think, I don't think I had any chicken. It was probably beef and fish mostly. Eggs, I might make, make my eggs, and I'd have some more eggs with whites and less with yolks, you know. And then I would alternate that depending on where I was. You know, in the, in the beginning, maybe every fourth or fifth day, I would have to reintroduce a relatively higher fat day. So I would go back to my sort of maintenance level why, of fat. Why would you have to reintroduce that? Uh, well, I, I, I just couldn't sustain the lean that long. I, I felt that I would start to get cold. Uh, you know, you, you probably have some thyroid uh, slow down, you know, your body's gonna, your body's going to, uh, it's going to shut down non-essential processes when it starts to feel that there's a threat of energy. And so to sort of <coughs> mitigate that, you would put in the, the fat back in for a little bit. So, so it would be, you know, like, like I say, you could do sirloin steaks for three or four days. And then on the fourth or fifth day, you're going to have a ribeye steak or some ribeye steaks. And then as you got leaner and leaner and leaner, those days, you couldn't go as long. So instead of every fifth day, you might get to every second or third second day because, you know, you're, you're again, you're, you're you're riding that, you're getting closer and closer to what you can handle. And, and so you're starving. You're starving. Well, yeah, your, your body is not, your body is going to do everything they can to stop starving. So if you're, if you're in a place where you find out you have no energy, you can work out, but as far as meat, you know, like the non-exercise exercise activity thermogenesis where you're moving around and, and, and ambulating and walking everywhere, that starts shutting down. You just don't have the energy to do that. You can work, you can get to your workout, but now the rest of the day you just want to sit on the couch, and then then you know you're like, I'm really struggling for for energy, and then you you, know, you feel cold. And your body's like, well, 
I don't have enough energy to, to, to create body heat, so I'm going to get colder and colder. So those are signs that you're, you're, you're riding the line. And, you know, if, if you keep riding that too hard, you're going to crash and burn, and then you're going to be face down in a pizza and ice cream, right? <laughs> so pretty much the protocol would be a couple of days of a leaner cuts mm -hmm. and then ramp up the calories with a higher fatty yeah, but you have to cuts. be careful because when I first did that, I was like, well, I'm going to eat a fat thing. It was all you can eat fat, and it would be like 9,000 calories. And so I'd, I'd do we should uh, do yeah, that. Yeah, Me yeah, and you, yeah, we should yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you, you do all I, the work I can't the last do that. Week. I've yeah. seen you guys in <laughs> hell. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would sit like, there, and I would be like, okay, I'm going to eat fat, and I would just, <laughs> I would glutton myself, and I literally had undone everything from the pr previous five days. And I was like, okay, so you got to – you got to, you still have to have the discipline to know that the, the fat is there for a purpose. It's not to get you, you know, right back to where you were or even behind because sometimes it goes backwards. So it's funny, you and I have never discussed this and we talk on a relatively regular basis, but the whole like weekends with ribeyes and lots of eggs and the weekdays with like leaner cuts of meat, I'm like doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, same here. That's yeah, all my just, protocols I mean, it makes, all my clients. It just makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that. Um, it's also, like I said, when it, when it's routine, when it becomes autopilot, it's so easy. Well, and you think about if that's your cheat, you know, a ribeye steak, I mean, okay, it's it's pretty well off. that's pretty good. You're pretty well off, right. you know, but when, but when you, you know, when you feel like you've got to cheat with donuts and ice cream, that's a problem, you know, cause then what's your base diet? You know, it's just, it's just, it's just driving you to this sort of. You know, you you can't have such a uh, schizophrenic diet where you know you're you're super strict, you're so hard on yourself, and then all of a sudden you just you you know you crash. And you you you've talked about that. You know, you're 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 like, I just like you, I have the capacity to be 300 plus pounds very easily. I could you know within three months I could do that very easy if I just ate uninhibited, ate whatever I wanted all the time. I still very much like you know it's kind of interesting. Some people go on a carnivore diet, they say. Oh, you know that that cake is disgusting. I would never eat it anymore. Not me. I'm like I'd eat the hell out <laughs> of that. That's what we stuff. talked yeah, about yesterday. I would eat it. I would, you know. Well, you might not want it. Like you're not sitting here thinking. <laughs> no, I don't about want it. Cake. But, but I mean, if, but if, if if somebody said, "Hey, guess what? Cake is healthy now. Sign me up." I'm yeah, yeah. The, the funniest thing that you said yesterday when we were watching the Budapest, you said your daughter was telling you, "Daddy." I wish sugar was healthy for us. And you, and you were like, me too, sweetie, me too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. And that's the most yeah, honest. So it's I just designed to taste good. It is supposed yeah, to taste yeah, good. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's killing us and it's yeah. driving all of these health issues that we suffer from today. Mm -hmm. But, John, you need to get as lean as possible, as quickly as possible. What do we do? Uh, like Sean said, it. Like that's, that's what I'm doing. It's basically what you're doing too. Uh, we all kind of came to the same conclusion. I think if you if you look at th there's two bodybuilders that I think absolutely have this nailed, Rob Sykes and Jonathan Griffiths, um, and uh, they Jonathan Griffiths has uh, the Carnivore Muscle uh, YouTube channel. Have you ever? You ever check? I it haven't. Out? I think I might have sent you one or two things. You, you, Dev, you talked to Jonathan. Yeah, right? I've interviewed him a couple times. Met him. Yeah, I, I actually yeah. just recently interviewed him, and um, that's that they're they're doing that same thing. Cycling. Just, yeah, like it's, it's like some way. days higher fat carnivore and some days leaner carnivore, and uh, you know it's just so you're you're making sure that you're getting all the fat, staying satiated, all the organs are functioning as well as they can, and you're getting your energy. From that but you don't need that every day so then the days that you're not is the days where you're at a protein surplus and calorie deficit and you're metabolizing your own body fat it's interesting that all of us kind of came to the same conclusion including jonathan you just mentioned yeah because and, and rob rob sykes <clears throat> and rob yeah. for example yeah. because rob that's exactly what i wrote about in my book, Weight Loss Without Plateau. Mm. That's the conclusion I came to after over 1,600 transformations in carnivore diet, that this was the best method to lose weight. And it seems like you guys came to the same conclusion. So that's exactly what I do with my clients. For a couple of days, I keep them on lower calories. And then on the weekends, I give them higher calories. Now, it prevents the plateau, so you're not going to get stuck at the same body weight and not being able to move because there's the metabolic adaptation, which I'd like to talk about. Um, where the body gets used to consuming the same amount of food and it's trying to survive from very little so it doesn't lose weight at the pace as it used to. And sometimes the weight loss just completely stops. 
So you might have like an 80 pound project planned out and you get to 25 pound weight loss and it's done, it's over. Cause you're constantly in that, let's say thousand calorie range. So eventually when you ramp up to physical activity, you might get the train rolling again, but you'll be blowing so much muscle and you start stressing the body out and the cortisol goes through the roof and the body fat really doesn't go as low as you really like it to. So that's why I started calorie cycling. Certain days you eat less, certain days you eat more. Same, con same conclusion as you guys. And I find maintenance of low body fats to be so much easier. Like what we talk about this, when we talk about this cycling, we're talking about reduction of the body fat. But what about the maintenance? What, what do we do in maintenance, Monchon? Well, I, you know, again, you have to get there first. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a big part of the battle. And you're absolutely right about the uh, adaptations you have. You know, we'll see, you know, uh, changes in body temperature. You know, people's temperature will change. Their heart rate will change, you know. Uh, you know, we'll see that. Like, like we see when we look at the opposite, opposite way, I've seen people do these short-term experiments where they overconsume calories and they don't get any weight, but then you check their temperature and their body temperature has gone up, their heart rate has gone up, and so they're actually burning more, and that's a temporary situation. But over the long term, you know, I think it's uh, – I know for me, I, I, I maintain about 285 pounds for about 20 years. That was my weight. I, it was hard for me to move that one way or the other without, ex, you know, extreme, uh, you know, uh, efforts. And then when I did get down to 240, when I got tired of being 280, um, I made that for 10 years, and it was, it was relatively easy. But, I mean, I think you get to a point – um, if you can maintain that weight for you know three to six months, I think you 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 re you reestablish re a new uh, homeostatic po point. So you've got this place where you're, you know, you're kind of at a place where your body's used to at this <laughs> point. Um, you know, again, I think that you, you know what we're, we're, when we think about why are we eating in the first place? I mean, that's 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 sort of an essential question. What are we trying to do when we eat? Well, we're trying to give ourselves essential amino acids essential fats, uh, vitamins and minerals, and then some level of energy. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we have to do. So as long as we are getting a steady, steady supply of that, and I think that's why carnivore is so helpful in that situation, is that, you know, we're getting what we need. I mean, you know, you think about it. I'm a surgeon. I've operated on, gosh, thousands and thousands of people. When you cut a human being open, they're made out of red meat. I mean, it's just what it is, and that's a lot of our mass. Mo in fact, most of our mass is consisted of that. And where do those where do those – individual parts come from when they come from you know eating the same thing more or less and uh you know when they say you are what you eat there, there's a lot of truth to that we're we are animals made out of animal cells and so as long as you're giving yourself a steady supply of that i think it becomes easier now again it depends where you where you want to hold your maintenance point because you know bodybuilders people with carrying extreme amounts of muscle are not normal in human nature i mean this is what i'm glad you said it yeah i mean yeah. it's what we're trying to do or what maybe you might, might want to do is not normal human physiology and so if you want to walk around at you know 250 pounds at you know six percent body fat you're never going to find like a native tribe <laughs> yes. that's doing that it just doesn't have it's not what humans are supposed <laughs> to be ever. so there's going to be some level of, of our body wanting to get to 10 12 14 percent body fat i think for a male that's probably a uh, a range that most people can exist in without effort you mm -hmm. know quite honestly if you're not eating garbage i think that's a pretty easy place to be but I think, you know, um, part of the thing, the discipline it requires to get to 8%, 7% body fat, you know, measured by DEX or something like that, are some of the habits you're going to need to maintain that in a way. And then you've got to figure out, um, you know, I, th I think it, it really is just a matter of saying, look, there's only a, an acceptable amount of deviation I'm going to allow myself to have from that. It's like, I'm okay gaining five additional pounds but no more and, and you just got to be you've got to be on it all the time there's no there's no i wish i could say it was easy and there was a, there's an easy button but it's always going to take hard work and discipline um and it's just got to become part of your life agreed. in many ways agreed john if you were about to get to the lowest possible body fat would you do some cardio no no the problem with like cardio or even walking is and we talked about this with our, uh, you know, research friends yesterday, uh, your it's conflicting goals. When you behave like you're, I'm going to make an engineering parallel here. 
So if you're an engineer and they tell you to build a Formula One car, you know, fast, powerful, like delivers power to the ground and moves that vehicle as fast as possible, there is a certain set of things you're going to look for. You're going to look for a big engine. You're going to look to not haul around a lot of fuel, like just exactly the amount you're going to need to complete the race. Uh, you're you're going to have a structure of that car that is incredible and can withstand all sorts of torsion and turns, right? So corollary of that is if you want something that's energy efficient as a vehicle, you know, like let's say a Prius, for example, it's a perfect example. So big gas tank, big battery, lots of storage, um, very lightweight frame. So, you know, you ever seen a crashed uh, a Prius, you know, they, they do protect the, the passengers, but they're, they're destroyed when they, when they get, when they get hit. Uh, and, and so now if we talk about how our central nervous system looks at us, our central nervous system is an engineering team that cannot talk to us, but it can help restructure our body, recompose our body based on the information that we give it. So if the information that we give it is strength training, bodybuilding, you're going to be more like the Formula One car. You're going to have high bone density. That's the structure. You're going to have a bigger engine. That's the muscle. And you're going to have very little storage. That's the body fat. If you start doing endurance type exercise, you're having that engineering team inside your body making the opposite decisions, which is we need to lower bone density to make you lighter so, it's, so you can move with less energy. Uh, you need to store more fuel. So like when people who do a lot of uh, cardiovascular exercise, they have high cortisol. What does cortisol do? It gets rid of muscle and preserves body fat, keeping you as fat as possible, as long as possible. I know I'm being dramatic when I'm explaining this, and it's very nuanced when people start doing it, but look at a marathon runner and look at a sprinter. You know, the marathon runner looks awful. <laughs> Sorry for all those runners out there, but, you know. Yeah, it's like a little bit of musculature and still some body fat. Like, they are lightweight, but there's still some body fat. Oh, yeah. The oh, they, they sell you that all over them. They do look terrible. So it, it's like you want to give the information to your central nervous system, which is that engineering team, that you want to be the Formula One car. Gotcha. Big engine, very little fuel storage, powerful chassis. Sean, would you do some cardio if you were trying to lean out as much as possible? Hit or steady? Well, yeah, I mean... Hit's a little different. I guess, you know, again, the question's like, you know, can I do it all on diet? And I think that's ultimately the, the more powerful lever, you know, diet versus doing cardio. Now, do I want to rely on all diet and, and, and maybe willpower? I don't know. I mean, maybe not. I mean, and I, you know, I don't... Like I said, you know, we had the discussion, maybe we shouldn't walk at all. There's going to be time part of your, of your life where you're like, I need to walk. And then, uh, then you're sort of making a calculation. Well, if I walk, am I losing muscle? Do I need to eat more? <laughs> you know, so, so, I mean, it's... it's you're you not going to go to Walmart anymore. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, think, I think there's... there's um, again, it depends on your goals. My goals are not to be the most shredded bodybuilder per possible. I, I like to have some functionality to what I do. And so, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not one particular type of car. I'm not, I'm not a sprint car, maybe. Uh, you know, so I've got a lot of things to do in life. So I, I, you know, again, and would I, would I walk on a treadmill for three hours in the morning or would I, would I go jogging? No, I wouldn't do that stuff. I mean, I do think some of the hit stuff for me is more enjoyable. It's more time efficient. Um, I like, um, as you guys know, I'm, 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 my focus is now on jumping and sprinting and those types of things. So those are those, those you know, in those situations, Jogging is very counterproductive to that. That's that's going to make me slower, literally, and it's just not, it's not what I want to do. Um, and I think most track and field athletes are, are kind of training that way. They know now that you know. I saw you know somebody asking Usain Bolt how far he runs, and he's never run a mile in his life. I mean, he's a world class sprinter. He's never run more than a mile, and it's like because he's never needed to. It. Specificity it, of training, yeah, and it would it would be counterproductive to them. But mm -hmm. um, I you know again, I think I think it gives you some flexibility to there. It's like, do I want to if if I can. You know, sometimes you like to eat, right? And you're like, well, if I'm going to eat, I'm going to go for a walk. You know, and I, I think, again, am I losing muscle? I think there's a there's a point where it becomes a problem. I know, you know, we, we, we talked with uh, Dr. Clemens last night, and uh, I think there's there's a point where that's a valid, valid issue. And, and, again, I mean, is me walking a mile going to make 
all my muscle here goes go away probably not you know but if i'm doing it three hours a day every single day you know then then you're in a different situation so that's an interesting perspective because that's exactly what i do three hours a day mm-hmm. i have three hours a day of watching every single day i wake up early in the morning i answer all of my emails messages i hop on my treadmill I set the pace to about three miles an hour, so I don't really have to think about it. But it's also very spiritual for me. So I do a lot of spiritual work on the treadmill. It's a lot of thinking, a lot of self-reflection, a lot of planning for the future. I talk to my clients on the treadmill. I do about 25,000 steps a day. But right now, since I was hanging out with you for the past couple days, I am going to give it a shot, and I'm going to cut my walking out completely for 30 days. I'm I'm going to manage my body fat just through the diet. Now, the only concern I have is my energy uh, expenditure is going to drop dramatically. So the amount of food that I'll be able to eat will be very low. That scares me because I love to eat. And now I'll see how this experiment goes, and I also see how the appetite is going to be like. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to realize the perspective from which she's talking about. I mean, her her primary concern is treating cancer patients and 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 and, and whatnot. Um, and I think the point is, if you run the engine too hard, too hot, is there an, is there a negative consequence? And there's other people who feel it like you know you only got so many heartbeats in your life, and if you use them up too much, you die early. I think that's quite honestly most likely nonsense. But um, so I mean, I, again, there there's this sort of balance of um, you know, how much metabolic metabolism do I go through? You know, because obviously if I'm walking three hours a day and eating an extra two, 3,000 calories a day, there's more metabolism going on. And does that have a net negative effect to us? And, and I think in some situations it might be. But again, I think, you know, what are the positives of that? What are you getting from that? Well, maybe you have a better... Uh, mental health. Well, better mental health. There might be some, some people make the argument on cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory fitness, um, which you can get through weightlifting, which is, which is clear. I mean, we know that's, that's the case. Um, so I think, I think, again, it's, it, it depends on, because I mean, you're maintaining 250 something pounds of lean mass, 255. At that, 255 or whatever it is. And, and so, I mean, obviously, you know, again, for the average person, that would be quite quite impressive i think and i know you you have aspirations behind far beyond average i know that's the case for you and so again it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for you so my personal goal is to drop the body fat as low as possible like if i could get it down to negative two i would yes <laughs> so the yesterday's conversation was very interesting because uh, dr clemens was very very clear like just resistant training just resistant training and you know what it actually it is worth my 30 day experiment to test it out and see how am I going to feel from the mental perspective because I love walking. I most of, most of my day I spend walking and talking to my clients, so now I take a big part of my activity away. But if it's for the better and it turns out to be better, I'll be very happy to talk about it. But as of right now, I'm a walker. I love walking. Um, I got myself down from – that's in-body measurements, though. Not accurate at all, but it's the only measurement that I was using consistently. So in-body was showing me about 19% body fat when I started, and I had got it all the way down to 45 which according to you, when we were working out, I was shirtless. You said, yeah, you're probably at about 8 somewhere around there, around on the DEXA scan, maybe. So none of us really measured it, but it's just kind of guess. However, my goal is to continue this fat burning journey, journey regardless how long it's going to take. If I can get a half a percent down in six months, I'm fine. I just need to see a continuous progress in less and less and less body fat. I'm obsessed with it. I love it. I really love dropping body fat. Like People ask me how much leaner you want to get. I want all the fat gone. Just cancel, delete. <laughs> That's it. But now, um, no, but that, that but that comes at a performance cost, as, as you probably certainly, know. Certainly, yeah. but yeah. I'm not as interested in lifting heavy things anymore. I used to be. I used to be very interested in that, but right now it's all aesthetics to me. I enjoy the beauty of low body fat. I'm really enjoying that journey. Yeah, but I mean, I, like I said, you know, it, it's, it's not just lifting heavy weights. It may be just just general performance in life. So, I mean, there's lower quality of life. Well, I mean, you, you know, there might be cognitive implications. There might be, you know, motivational impl- implications. You know, so I mean, I, it's just something I would be. You know, well, you know, if you talk to any bodybuilder, you know, the last three weeks into a contest prep, they're not good people to be around. No, many and well, they lose their sex drive. But I, but I, but I mean, I think you know, yeah. for for. But I will say, if you make sure you're getting adequate fat, you may be able to obviate you know you may be able to sort of counter some of those concerns so it'll be interesting to see how you 
how you do with that and see how you feel. But you know, that's why I wanted to mention like. I think the approach is also going to matter. But as you're saying, if I run into any issues that are going to lower quality of my life, I'm going to try. I'm just going to try it. But I just love doing this, you know, <laughs> like yeah. seeing how far I can push the low body fat. John, is there any negative effect or any any harmful potential to be very low on body fat? What can happen? Oh, when yeah. Way too low? Yeah. You, you mentioned a couple of them. I mean, um, you lose function some things uh, you can't even think straight uh also your testosterone production crashes um, i'm on trt so yeah yeah same but still i i would i would rather be because we know about the testosterone what do we not know about there's a lot of things going on in the body that's that a good question just been <laughs> just not been documented yeah. yet i was talking to some uh researchers that were uh they're, they're actually doing some research on my first invention on osteostrong um and they were talking about growth factors that have yet to growth factors they've identified but only have a number assigned to them they don't even have a name yet mm -hmm. so like we have growth factors in the body that are basically only preliminarily discovered and so like you know if testosterone so it's like if one thing is being compromised and we think well we got a band-aid for that yeah but what about the other things that we don't understand Mm -hmm. So I think if one thing's starting to be compromised, maybe other things are, are going to be compromised. And, you know, I think um, you the, the longer one is leaner, there's a different homeostasis. So you, you can get there and you can maintain low body fat for extended periods of time, uh, but not, you know, not 0%, not, you know, 1%. It, it's just... It, it's just um, you're always pushing sort of a limit where you might be crossing into not that healthy. So. Well, I mean, you know, I guess, I mean, you're, you're quite lean right now. I mean, lean, probably maybe leanest you've ever been. I don't know. I did uh, body weight. Yeah. So you're like, how do you feel? You're like incredible. Okay. So a I mean, million bucks. That, that, I never felt better in my so life. That, 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 that's a good, that's a good position to be in. And so it's, I think it's very instructive for people to get down there at least one time in their life. And so they know what, you know, what it takes to get there, what it feels <laughs> like, um, teaches you a lot about your own metabolism. There's a lot of things you learn from that that can be useful. And then the question is, you know, I mean, because you're what? How old are you? You're like 30, -ish. 30, 30. I mean, you know, I'm almost 60. So there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of things that happen over that over that period of time, and a lot of things that happen in life that, um, you know, that are, that are gonna potentially impact you. But I, you know, I I don't see any reason you couldn't walk around at this body composition. Pretty much year round. I mean, I think, and that's that, that's quite a task already. And then, if you get down to, let's say, on a DEXA scan, or, you know, sub five percent body fat, something extremely, I want to get there. Contest stage ready. You know, I don't know that that's sustainable year round. It might be. Maybe maybe you prove, prove us wrong. I w I will find out for sure. Hey, how about Roger Snipes? Like he he stays very low. That's incredible. Like I, I, he's an, I mean, he's a, he, Roger was a, he's a natural bodybuilder, absolutely amazing. He hung out with us. He was here in Bratislava with us at the Carnival Conference. Um, he's an example of somebody who can keep it low uh, and but relatively effortlessly. Well, you know, I mean, relatively effortlessly. But, I mean, he's claiming what was his, what was his caloric. He was saying he eats 1,600 calories a day at a, what, around, around 200 pounds, which maybe – you know. it, it, so what he I doesn't count as calories though i i would argue that there's probably a few days where he does you know uh do do more of a, a surplus uh probably the days he trains hard now he was also it was also a rest day for him when he was hanging out with us gotcha yeah S sean what is your take on trt well i i don't take it i mean i, I just you know I, I you know like i said i think that um in many cases, it's it's a metabolic band-aid for a lot of people. I mean, I think personally, I think it's overprescribed. I mean, as a physician, I mean, in in the in the sense that I saw a lot of patients that were on TRP, TRT, they're still obese, still overweight, wasn't doing anything. Probably most of it was being converted to estrogen, quite honestly. Um, and I think that you know, if you don't have your di your your diet and lifestyle dialed in first. To me, it's pointless at that point you know, for many people. I think you've got to spend yeah. at least a year. And, and I don't mean just, you know, 
half ass it. I think I think it takes a lot of de- uh, effort and consistency to get there. I think that you know obviously the downsides, you know, it shuts down in, in endogenous production. You don't have the sort of the pulse of tile, um, you know, in general, uh, you know, because it was you know most people take it in some sort of weekly, you know, mm-hmm. injectional mm-hmm. dose, and you get this super high level and it plateaus down and it's not it doesn't mimic i know you'll want to talk about something john but yeah it won't it won't allow you to naturally mimic the natural circadian cycle of, of what testosterone testosterone is supposed to do and so i think that uh you know as i see you know more and more younger and younger guys on it, it you know it's it's often i question if they need to be on that quite honestly and i think we've gotten to a point where it was vilified for a long period of time you know Um, And then it became accepted. And now it's almost being like expected, which I think is a problem. When when a 16-year-old kid says, oh, I need to go on TRT by the time I'm 22, almost unquestioningly, I think there's a – you have to to reflect on that. And I think the problem is, you know, you have uh, so many people out there that they they don't know what's achievable without it. And I think that's something that, you know, like like I said, you know, I think I do okay – um, certainly you can point to examples of people that are way bigger and stronger than me. Uh, but, you know, again, w- it depends on what you want to go. I mean, if, if your goal is to be the biggest, strongest person in the world, yet load up on every steroid known to man, uh, you know, I mean, you can take high-dose testosterone, I suppose, uh, and get a, a, a decent effect from that. But, I mean, I think you have to be cautious in, in assuming it's the answer uh, to a problem, even low testosterone. I mean, uh, there are a lot of meta- metabolic things that I think are, are – you know, running at the same time. And the other thing a lot of people do is they look at their number, like, what's my testosterone? Well, it's only 600, I want it 900. Well, one of the things we know is that the receptor uh, density and sensitivity has a big role in, in how it's expressed, you know. Let's say, um, there, we, we all know about insulin resistance. Everybody talks about it all the time. Uh, our insulin gets higher and higher and higher, which we know is a bad thing. Uh, because we need it to overcome the resistance from the insulin res- uh, receptors, and it's differential. You know, when we get when we become insulin resistant, we become insulin resistant to the effect of insulin moving glucose into the cell, right? But it, we don't necessarily become insulin resistant to the ability of fat to be stored. So what happens is you need more and more insulin to get glucose in the cell, but now you're much a- easier able to, to to accumulate fat into the fat. And yeah. so, testosterone has multiple effects on multiple tissues in the body. Obviously, muscle. But then we talk about prostate and other tissues where, you know, if one is more sensitive than the other and one's more resistant to the other, you've got the right dose t- to maintain muscle, but do you have too much for the prostate, for instance? And I know we've got longitudinal data, and you know, the long-term data seems it's generally pretty safe with cardiovascular risk. Some question about does it increase your risk for, for uh, things like prostatic cancer. I mean, that's, again, th- again that's questionable. Um, my stance in general is if you don't need to be on a drug, don't be on a drug, right? I mean, that's, that's my general stance. Now, I know there are people out there for optimal performance or, you know, certain goals, uh, you know, better better living through pharmacology. That's, or I've seen that talked about many, many times. And I, I just tend to say just be cautious around this stuff. And like I said, if you don't maximize the lifestyle stuff first and see what you're left with. And if you're satisfied with that, good. But if you don't do it, just don't hop to the drugs immediately because I think that – often creates more problems than it's going to solve. Yeah, that's really f- fair advice. John, what, you th- what, what do you think about the TRT? It's funny. I, I think you think I'm going to disagree with some of those things. No, I don't. I, I don't yeah, I, I don't, actually I don't, agree I don't. with absolutely everything you said. Um, I, I think you were going to disagree. I, I, there's different ways to get around the pulse of tile. Yeah, I'll, things, get, I'll get to yeah, that. Right, right. The uh, So the reason maybe that 16-year-olds think TRT is right for them is because – because of crummy diet, people are getting lower. Like every generation, it gets uh, some X percentage lower. And so we have people like like when I was in, you know, I was in my 20s. So the reason I got a TRT prescription is uh, I destroyed one of my testicles and a bad rugby hit. So I, I lost it. And, uh, you know, a couple years later, I was having heart palpitations on mm-hmm. the rugby field. And, you know, there, I go to a cardiologist and he says, your cardiac muscle is paper thin. It's like you have a really weak heart. And I'm like, dude, I play rugby. That's like 80 minutes of sprinting and repositioning. Like, I got to have the best heart of anybody. And the guy says, let's take a look at your testosterone. 
So send me to an endocrinologist. I had 163 nanograms of the deciliter, mm. uh, which is very, very low. Yeah. Uh, and so <clears throat> that was when I was given the prescription, and uh, it made a huge difference for me, and my heart became very strong, and, and everything went well. So it was a very different reasoning for, for mine, and it also gave me a slightly different perspective. I didn't really see it from a performance perspective, like it was never about performance, and in fact, I, I would say in the first year or two, even though I was strength training, I put on zero muscle, and I thought, okay, so testosterone in itself is not really the answer. I, I didn't know what my problem was and why I couldn't gain muscle, uh, but it it made no difference for me whatsoever. Um, but I really think it's like these young younger people. You know, they're younger and younger wanting testosterone. I think part of it is they just think it's, you know, an, an easy, you know, they hit the easy button. Uh, and it's, that's not, ex not at all what it is. Uh, <clears throat> but then with just how just crummy of diet. And so we can fix that problem with diet and get them producing a normal amount of testosterone again. Now, uh, one of the things that I thought was always a drawback was you take, you know, your testosterone and one or two shots a week and basically it goes up real high and then gets down real low and then goes up real high and you're having all sorts of issues and side effects, estrogen conversion from that, you know, during the high points and then the low points, you just... Er energy is all over the place. Yeah, energy is all over the place and you feel like crap. And, right, and sometimes, you know, your, your, your sex drive is through the roof and it's almost like a problem and then other times you just, you know, you're not interested in that at all. And, uh, and it just feels really crummy. Like now, Primal Medical Group has uh, oral testosterone, so no more injections, and it's a very fast metabolizing. Isn't toxic to the liver? No. It's, yeah, that's another problem that's solved. So oral testosterone, um, oral testosterone undecanoate, specifically. Uh, it is paired with it's suspended in castor oil and it's and you want to take these they're just capsules you take the capsules with fats so that uh it, it's lymphatic uh absorption so what you do is like my my dosage is 800 milligrams of testosterone under can weight a day which sounds like crazy huge but you only absorb four percent of it Gotcha. Because of the lymphatic absorption. So it's so, not methylated. No, it is not methylated. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it absorbs through the lymphatic system. So basically I'm getting 32 milligrams. That's 4% of 800. 32 milligrams per day uh, of the days that I take it. Mm -hmm. Because a non-training day, I might cut my dosage in half. When do you take it? Or first thing in the morning. So you're following the circadian well, rhythm. Right, right. So it's supposed to be like if you look at, mm -hmm. uh, I got a great infographic I lifted out of a study uh, that shows the normal up and down regulations. It's basically it starts to climb when you start your day and start walking around and uh, peaks you know, around, if you get up at eight in the morning, peaks around, around like 11, stays high to right noon and then it starts going down. And it doesn't really matter when it's in your system. Most of the muscle you grow is at night uh, when your body's basically Sweet. recovering from the things you did during the day and rebuilding cells. So it doesn't need to be high. And the problems that we see with standard testosterone replacement therapy, and especially people who do steroid cycles, they take an injection that's long lasting. And at night they have high testosterone, which the body is saying, whoa, this is wrong. So it starts up regulating SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. So sex hormone meaning testosterone, binding meaning attaches to that testosterone and makes it inert, which is another word for worthless. So, <laughs> right, and so SHBG goes up and basically cancels out your, your testosterone replacement therapy. And I think part of my problem when I first got on TRT, I, from, from a how I felt perspective, it was great. And my cardiac muscle was great. Uh, but I, I was like, wow, where's all this muscle I was supposed to gain? Well, after 60 days, that's when your up, up regulation happens uh, of SHBG. 
And so I was probably perpetually in this position where I had high testosterone, high SHBG, which equals kind of nothing. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, it cancels, it cancels itself out. So I think the oral approach is much safer and uh, as long as the candidate is is the right person, you know they're not young. Uh, they're they've already fixed their nutrition because that that's going to be a huge, uh, huge thing. And also, I, I think there's a myth out there that's like you're not going to grow muscle unless you're at like 900 nanograms of the deciliter. I know people who gain muscle and are natural athletes, and you know, like when they get lean, they're like 400. But mm -hmm. they can still hold on a whole lot of muscle. Uh, and in fact, a uh, mutual friend of ours, Kevin Chang, he's in, a, he's in a bodybuilding league that doesn't even allow for TRT. So he can see his testosterone go up when he's eating carnivore, and it goes down when he's dieting for his contest uh, just because of all the, the downsides of getting super lean. So then, I mean, of course... Kevin's sort of an anomaly because he looks lean all the time, but he is definitely leaner when he goes to his show than than uh, the other other times of the year. So it's a, just a great example of like how that is managed from a natural perspective. And I think now with this oral testosterone, uh, it becomes managed very well for the people who are compromised, and and they can have a, a great level of testosterone. Also. It's non-suppressive, so the the 32 milligrams I get per day are additive to whatever my body makes. It doesn't shut my testicular function down. That's huge. So no no problems so with it's the not liver. The potency. Right, right. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, the 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 reason why I got into the steroids early on in my life was simple. I just wanted to be a monster. <laughs> That's all I was thinking about as yeah. a kid. I was about 20 years old or something. I started taking some gear. I started training uh, for the bodybuilding competitions. And after that, after about four or five years of competing in NPC, I stopped competing. Then that's when I pretty much just went on a lower dose of testosterone. TRT, slightly above TRT, somewhere in that range. I check my hemoglobin all the time, check my liver enzymes, kidneys, blood pressure, everything Everything is normal. Mm. Could I have done any damage from those four to five years of competitions? Possibly. I don't really know. We'll see, I guess. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a tax to pay for everything you do with the body. But so far, I really feel amazing. I felt amazing back then, too. I really didn't have no bad side effects. Mm. So, I mean, I felt amazing when I was taking it. I felt amazing after I was taking it. I, everybody talks about some crazy side effects and acnes and water retentions no i had none of that i just felt good and when i stopped taking it uh, the muscle mass of course went down the muscle density like the hard vascular look went away and all of that was gone but in terms of feeling i still felt pretty good because if like i, I don't really get when guys say like oh yeah i'm feeling horrible all these side effects and stuff well just stop taking it what the hell are you doing like right. if you feel bad just stop like that's my basic <laughs> common sense when yeah. it came to this now, when it comes to exercise, Sean, one really big question for you. I know you're not really interested in uh, gaining muscle for the aesthetics, but would there be a, a different approach for you if you now decided that you want to have as big of the muscles as possible and you wouldn't worry about the strength? Would you train differently? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What yeah. would you do? Well, I mean, I think, again, I, I think it's, you know, bringing enough stimulation to the muscle to that you induce hypertrophy and i think that's what is that well i mean you know i think again the literature generally suggests some level of of getting close to failure bringing reps close to failure and i've john i know john's been talking about lengthening partials i mean i think the literature is is suggesting that that's beneficial and again um you know i would do more isolation exercises probably um you know, the way I train right now is very much not about maximizing muscle growth. I mean, so I, there, there were, there'd be a lot of things I'd do differently. Um, so we got isolation exercises? Yeah, I do. I do more isolation exercise. I'd probably do probably more volume than I'm currently doing, you know, in, in, in at that level of, uh, of failure. Can you explain uh, the volume a little more? How many sets and how many well, reps would you do? Well, you know, I think that probably... I mean, again, going to the literature that I'm familiar with, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 sets per week seems to be seems to be a range that, that many people seem to 
seem to benefit. Maybe more advanced athletes might might even benefit from slightly more. Um, and I think it depends a little bit on the muscle group as well. You know, um, would reps matter? Um, to a degree, to a degree. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, theoretically, the reps don't matter as long as you get to that level of fatigue or that mm -hmm. level of failure. However, from a practical standpoint, if I need to do a hundred reps of something to fail, it's just not going to be practical. Too it's much time. Not, yeah. So, so I mean, you know, you you get somewhere in the six to twenty reps is probably a, a pretty place, a pretty practical place to be. You know, and I, I've done. Uh, I've done sets of 20. I've done sets of 100 at a time. You know, I, sometimes I do variety just for, just for different challenges. But, I mean, I think somewhere in that neighborhood is uh, pretty pro – I don't like doing heavy singles anymore. I mean, it's just not I, – I don't have an interest in powerlifting. I did that when I was in my – your age, when I was in my 30s, and I was excited <laughs> about how much could I deadlift and bench and squat. And uh, that, to me – I don't see a value in that at this point in my in my life, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I would I would probably you know hit body parts two to three times per week, uh, trying to get somewhere in a ten twelve ish sets per body part, and in each of those sets being intense enough to bring me to either failure or very close to failure. I think that's what I would I would emphasize. I would um, probably well, I'd certainly eat more. I mean, you know, again, but you know, again, for me to be with my frame, I'd have to weigh 300 pounds, and that's just not where I want to be at 60 years of age. So Because of health. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you said when you were my age, you used to do single reps. Mm. I cannot do single reps no more. If I've done single reps now, I would probably need a shoulder surgery within a year. Just for fun, I haven't lifted weights in a really long time. We're in a hotel right now, downtown Bratislava. They have a bench press there. So I load up 315. I haven't lifted 315 in a very long time, probably five years since I've been using the H3. And I lay down, I do over 20 reps. The 315? Yes. Wow. And still, till today. Like, that was one thing I always done was 315 for very high reps. I was like 325 back then. Um, so I wanted to give it a try to be, because that was truly my favorite exercise. I loved it. It was just fun for me. I was very excited to go to the bench press. But I had to stop because my shoulders started getting pinch in pain. So I managed it at the age of 25 by just not doing bench press. It went away. It all figured itself out. But ever since then, I couldn't do bench press. So five years later, I put 315 on. I do over 20. I get the pain again. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. And I'm like, please, God, make this pain go away by tomorrow. And I promise you I won't do it again. <laughs> like the message is clear. Because it is just a heavy weight. And even though it's a weight that I can comfortably control, um, I can't do it all the time. I just can't do it all the time. The issue is just the load at the bottom. It is. It's, it is. it's like, it, like <clears throat> I think there's some bad advice out there. The idea, like lengthened partials, great idea. I mean, also... It, it's one of those things, and Sean and I were talking about this this morning, like the idea that you stimulate more muscle growth in the more stretched position, like like bottom of the bench press, well, yeah, that's where you go to fatigue, uh, whatever kind of rep you're doing, whether it's a partial rep or a full rep. Because when you're doing a bench press, once you get past that sort of stretched part of the pectoral, well, then the rest of it's easy. So you're really only loading the body to any significant degree at the bottom when you're lifting weights anyway which is why variable resistance has been so powerful of a strength building tool and muscle building tool because you have a uniform difficulty through the entire range of motion but you can have higher resistance at the top which is going to make you stronger and then you can do a lot of lengthened partials to make sure you're getting the most stimulus for growth because that's where the muscular size stimulus happens in the in the stretch portion of of the range of motion as the literature determines today uh, this could change there could be more research but uh there was a study that was published i think just a couple days ago brad schoenfeld uh it was his team that, that put it out uh the length and partial only workouts versus full range workouts same results now of course because it's the same thing 
with regular weights, you're only stimulating at the bottom because the bottom is the only place it's heavy. But with variable resistance, you're getting stronger and bigger. That's what I noticed. Yeah. I saw from the experience. Yeah. Sean. And 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 no joint pain. Because that was that was where we started. It like it's like you because you, myself. you can you can exhaust part of the musculature in your strength work, but then as you're doing those length and partials in the last, you know, few repetitions, last six or seven repetitions of the set, you're using a lighter weight, which isn't gonna screw up the joint and is not gonna give you pain. Like I've never been bigger and stronger than I am right now in my life. I've never been leaner, but I've also I'm also completely pain free. I when I, get, when I get out of bed, I feel like I'm 19. And that's a great example that you're always older every single year, and you're always in better shape every single year. Yeah. So you can't really just say that because of this and that age, I cannot get in shape. In my personal experience, I did clients who are 70, 75, 60, yeah. 50, 40, all kinds of age groups, and they're all improving. Like every single human body is capable of. Storing energy, releasing energy, <coughs> getting stronger, getting weaker. It's just the natural cycle of the body. As long right. as you're alive, this is going to be happening. I, I think one thing that would shock most people is th sort of for the casual observer, they see people at a powerlifting meet, and they think what they do at the powerlifting meet is how they train. It's not. Not necessarily. Especially not now. West Side Barbell uses variable resistance. The head of strength conditioning for Westside Barbell is a f friend of mine. His name is Craig Bongelli. Um, very, I think I, I, I got this on video. It'll be part of a, a documentary film. But he was like, if you look at the strongest people in the world, they all have just one thing in common, and it's variable resistance. Because you can get more out of adaptation by loading. It's, a, it's a, just a strategy of getting more force through the muscle without the damage that is normally associated with force through the muscle. Sean, I can eat whatever I want as long as I'm in calorie deficit. What do you think? Well, I mean, what outcome are you looking at? Losing <laughs> weight, maintaining muscle mass. Uh, well, I mean, I think that's a broad thing. Can you eat Oreo cookies all day at, at a calorie deficit. Anything I want in a cal as long as the calorie deficit is there, I'm going to lose weight and build muscle. Well, I so think we can imagine yeah, all yeah. food groups, right, all food right, groups. Right, right. There's right. no limitations. Well, I mean, if we define a calorie deficit, I mean, you know, like how do you define that? Well, I mean, you're burning more calories than you're consuming, right? What are you What are you measuring at that point? Well, you can you can look at what's going in and, and kind of get an <laughs> approximation. Again, that's that's confounded by how much is actually being absorbed, how much is being consumed by your microbiome. So you're never completely accurate on that. But let's just say, can you, you explain how much is being consumed by your microbiome? Uh, well, again, there's studies that suggest that up to 22 percent of our calories can be consumed by our microbiome. 22 percent. Up to now, now that Does depends it differentiate on that, that on it depends on what the food is, right? So some food more, some food less. Protein, carbs, and fats. Yeah, and, and how it's processed. And this is one of the problems we're seeing is that. As we've become more and more ultra-processed in our food, less and less of those calories are being consumed by our microbiome, and they're being absorbed. And so even though we're eating the same amount of calories, we're getting fatter and fatter because we're, we're over-absorbing energy, right? And so, uh, you know, the other aspect of it is, of course, the protein part of the equation. Oreo cookies are not high in protein. You know, if I was eating, uh, you know, 1,500 calories of Oreo cookies and 2,000 calories of, I don't know, salmon, right, for, for example, uh, I would imagine that certainly I'm going to uh, uh, maintain more muscle, you know, on, on that. Well, even if there the calories were equated, I'm going to maintain more muscle with a higher protein uh, type of food. Um, that's not to, that's also, you know, again, that's, that's, that's a, a hypothetical scenario that doesn't exist in the real world because, again, appetite, as you know, I mean, appetite, what you eat, dramatically impacts your appetite and your satiety. If you're not eating foods that provide <coughs> a decent level of satiety, unless you are, you, so you're locked in jail and, and they're feeding you, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to sustain that. That's why human studies are so hard to do. That's why animal studies are because I was just speaking, I was a keynote speaker at a large veterinary conference a couple of weeks ago in, in Columbus, Ohio. And you know, the guys are, yeah, we agree, we can, we can do whatever we want with the animals because we can control every aspect every variable we can control and so we know much more about how nutrition works in, in various animals whereas humans 
it's really hard to do those. It's unethical to do those studies, you know. I mean, outside of, you know, maybe Nazi Germany, they could have <laughs> perhaps done that. It wouldn't have been ethical, but they could have maybe done those studies. And so they weren't worried about that. Compared to what they've done, this would be just much more. Right, difficult. right. You could do that. But I mean, there is, uh, I think, you know, that, that, that statement, you know, with regard to weight loss, will you lose weight? Yes, if you're in a calorie deficit, regardless of what you're calorie. You know, there's a professor at University of Iowa who did this famous Twinkie experiment, which got a lot of play because he lost weight. And he actually showed some improvements in some of the health markers. But I think long term, you're going to lose more muscle. You're going to uh, probably develop some sort of chronic disease, I mean, depending on what it is. I mean, we're, we're consent, you know, I think, you know, right now in the U.S., back home, there's a, there's, there's a Senate um, uh, hearing going on where they're talking about ultra processed foods and the problem they've, they've had a lot of a lot of people I know are testifying at that right now um, and you know they're showing that the food that we are consuming irrespective of the caloric ca- the content is literally damaging us in, in, in many ways autoimmune disease mental health dis- disorders you know uh, cancers you know you name it every, every disease out there is, is a problem and so um, so yeah I mean could you lose weight by just not eating? Yeah, you, cl- you clearly will. Could you lose weight by eating 800 calories a day? Yeah, you probably will. You know, I mean, you almost definitely will, depending on what you're starting at. But is that going to give you an equal outcome if you did it with a different type of food? I don't think so. One little thing that I would add into that is when we take a, when we take a look at the weight loss as the, as the project, let's say we got 80-pound project to, to do. To do. And now you're going to burn 3,000 calories every day and eat 1,500 calories of ultra-processed foods. In my experience, you're not going to make it to 80. Somewhere in that road, you're going to get stuck. There's going to be an adaptation, and that's it. And now you're burning a lot of muscle mass, so your basal metabolic rate drops significantly. You're stressing the body out because now you're becoming nutrient deficient. There's no nutrients to recover the hormones and tissues of the body, which is pretty much the only reason why we eat. So now you're running into all these health issues while you're stressing the body out with the diet and insufficient amount of energy itself. Like that's a stress enough. And now you're eating less, and even what you're eating is not supporting the recovery of the body, just double up the stress on well, the body. Well, so how would you, know, you feel? Well, let's look at, like, for instance, the new, the new weight loss drugs, the GLP-1s, you know, Azempic and so on and so forth. I mean... Without any significant, uh, you know, if you just say, Doc, you put me on the drug, I'm going to take the drug, and I'm going to lose 50 pounds, right? What will happen without other modifications? You know, you're just going to continue your, your normal diet. You will, <coughs> you will lose weight. You will lose probably more muscle, significantly more muscle. Um, you'll lose some body fat. You will be at a lighter weight but probably a worse body composition, and that arguably is a worse situation yeah. for you. And so I mean, it's you know, like, like I said, it's 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 you know, it, it, you could actually argue that you could make someone worse off by dieting in a way or taking drugs in a way that make them lose weight. I mean, generally, weight loss is a good thing, but again, if it comes at a significant loss of muscle, um, it's a problem. It's a real problem. There's John, calories in, calories out. What you think? Yeah, it's not how it works. There's, it just ignores the significance of hormones or, or uh, just how our body uses what we take in. Uh, yeah, it's like, <laughs> and, and the funny thing is when you start reading the research, you realize how simpleton that statement is, the calories in, calories out. Like it's, it's trying to, I think one of the problems that the fitness community has is they want to simplify all the advice into a meme, you know, a sentence fragment with a funny picture. Like, okay, cute, but it's way more complicated than that. And uh, the uh, desire for simplicity is totally fucking us. Uh, because it's like you want to summarize nutrition in the calories in, calories out. Well, like from a... And it's funny, the calories in, calories out, people seem to love epidemiologic studies, uh, which are survey-based studies. So when people fill out the survey, are they really telling the truth? I don't know. Uh, But if you look at calories consumed 
divided by people, we're actually eating less calories than we were 30, 40 years ago. Yet people are fatter. So from a population standpoint, that's absolutely wrong. It is not calories in, calories out. Because the calories that people are choosing to consume, I'm talking broad population here, are contributing to higher levels of body fat storage. And like the calories in, calories out completely ignores the idea that protein has no mechanism for being stored as body fat. That's what Jofia said yesterday. Yeah. Like there's after comments. Like you if you eat too much protein, you basically get hotter. You sweat more because your body's trying to use that energy and has no method of of storing it. So yeah, you know, when somebody says that, it's it's a standard answer and it's very popular in fitness and also, I don't really see myself as a person who's in the fitness industry, even though I make, uh, I mean, I think the greatest fitness device ever. Uh, and I think a lot of people would, you would agree with me. I uh, love it. I yeah. use it every day. Yeah, it's, um, you'd probably agree with me <laughs> to well, a degree. I was going to say, mine got stolen, so I. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it was so great. That's just to prove that it's great. It's, three. it's just to prove um, that it's great. Somebody just yeah, took it yeah. away from you. It, it, it's like one, one of those things. So I, I developed this product, and it provides fitness, but I don't really see it as a fitness product because I'm really trying to get it to people who, maybe gave up on fitness because I think about 99% of people who try to be fit fail. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Some of the reasons are very complicated having to do with where your tendons attach. But um, it's like 1% of the population gets great results out of regular weightlifting and, and you know, 99% either gets poor results or zero result. Uh, so, you know all those all those things, and as it as it comes back to nutrition, the fitness people certainly want to be part of that conversation, and so they keep coming in and saying calories in, calories out. And I'm looking at the fitness industry. It's like you you guys have you got you get an F fucking minus on everything you've pretty much ever done. Fitness is the absolute hands down most failed human endeavor. Uh, like how many people are actually really fit? Like, it's completely abnormal. Like, when we walk down the street, we're very fit people. People, like, point at us. Like, we're all we've been walking around brought us a lot of people are like, look at those guys. Like, it shouldn't be like that. Most people should be like us. And that's kind of my goal. Like, I don't, I'm working with a lot of athletes. But the, the methods from both, I think, the nutrition, even though a lot of people think our, our nutrition is extreme. I don't think it's extreme at all. It's just appropriate. Uh, and, and the exercise, the way I'm, way I'm approaching exercise, it's so accessible even for elderly people, for compromised people. It's one of those things. So I, I really just want to point out, and I frequently do point out, that the nutrition recommendations from the fitness industry have failed everyone. So why are we still listening to calories in, calories out? Yeah, let me just, just to clarify a point that John made. I think the data from, from about 20 years ago shows no real increase in caloric. I mean, from 1960s to about 2000, we ate some more food. But particularly the last 20 years, there's been no significant increase in caloric consumption in the U.S. Uh, yet we've seen a dramatic rise in the obesity rate, so even over that period of time. And I think one of the things to look at is, is the degree of ultra-processing, as I alluded to before. If you eat more and more ultra-processed foods, I mean, you think about how the human uh, digestive system is supposed to work. If you and I were to walk out in the woods to go get food, we would never, ever find powder to consume. It just does not exist in any form at all that we would ever consume it in. And so we have this highly absorptive powder that we're consuming, and that basically bypasses any of that 22% the microbiome can consume. So now we are actually absorbing significantly more of, of the food, and, and that's leading to, I think, greater and greater. So we're not effect. consuming more calories. We're absorbing more. But we're because getting of the fatter. We're getting fatter because we're absorbing more of that. It and sounds then, and like two words, insulin resistance. Yeah, well, right. I mean, it certainly it, it, it contributes the to result. that. Right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to contribute to that. And I think that, um, you know, the fact that also the, the ultra-processing of the food uh, also, and another study has said, you know, Kevin Hall did a study about three years ago showing that people that eat ultra-processed foods spontaneously consume more of it but also japan just confirmed that the other day so we have these ultra processed foods that 
we tend to eat a little more of, but we also absorb significantly more of them just because of the degree of ultra processing. So it changes the way we do, we absorb things, and you know the way our digestive system is supposed to work. Uh, meat is a perfect example. It takes a long time to absorb meat. It's by design. You know, our body, the whole GLP one uh, system, which is azempic, which is azempic. You know, gluc- glucosinolate peptide, which is considered an accretin hormone. And so those are those are basically produced in the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestine. There's this concept called the ileal break. And so what happens is when nutrients start getting to the end of the small intestine, particularly if there's enough of it, the small intestine says, wait a minute, too much food is getting in here. We're not absorbing enough. So it sends a signal to slow everything down. So it just slows down the digestion so that we actually absorb the nutrition. And that's what meat is very beef. Beef has been shown very effectively to stimulate GLP-1 in a physiologically appropriate manner. So now what we're doing is we're dosing these drugs in mega doses. It's shutting the gut down. And so now things like processed carbohydrates just sit in the gut, don't get absorbed. And a lot of people are having significant side effects associated with that. So that's a, that's a problem. You don't have to re like you don't have to be really a Sherlock in nutrition to listen to this and understand that it's not supposed to be like that. Like you're not supposed to inject yourself with the azempic and now consume all these carbohydrates that are well, just sitting there like you here, said. And this is a this is a frustrating thing. You know, uh, as I mentioned, there, there's a, there's been a huge t- uh, Senate hearing going right now, testimony, people saying people are sick, people are fat, chronic diseases is through the roof. We've got to do something wrong. The food supply is a real significant problem. And the, the press release from that panel mm-hmm. came out to say chronic disease is through the roof. We need bipartisan efforts to fund Ozempic to Medicare. <laughs> that was their so that that is their that is what they are they're hearing the problem. They're saying we don't like your solution. We want to do the drug solution because again, every congressman, every senator has three lobbyists from the pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical industry yelling in their ear here in the U.S. and it's it's just a it's a it's a really uh, frustrating situation. My, as much as I applaud those guys for getting a bit going up to the U.S. Congress and Senate and testifying, I don't know the legislative solution is going to be the answer. I, as much as I, th- I hope that we get people in there to understand that, uh, it's still going to come up to the, the individual person. And, and, and again, the way I look at chronic disease as a physician is ch- chronic disease is a nutrition problem for most people. And the problem with that is they are addicted to poison and garbage. And until you can address the addictive nature of food, until you can you can consistently uh, change that, you can legislate, you can inject. It's not going to fix the problem. You've got to figure out ways to make people understand about satiety, understand about having the ability to resist this stuff because it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. You know, you can you imagine if heroin was legal, came in fifty seven flavors. Your grandmother gave it to you, and everybody in society told you you deserve <laughs> it, right? We would have all, all a bunch of heroin addicts, and that's equivalent what we have now. We have people that are processed food addicts, and they're getting sick, and they're you know society's falling apart because Speaking of Speaking about heroin, I have a client who owns the addictive clinic, pretty much where all the addicts go to heal themselves, and he was saying it is much harder to change the diet and stop the heroin. And I'm like, what? He's like, yes. If you stop the heroin, you stop the heroin. That's it. You don't take it ever again. Well, with the food, you can stop eating forever. Right. So you have to change the relationship. Mm-hmm. So it's like you're taking well, a heroin, just different. You see what I mean? So that's the, that's the challenge. But, 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 the, when, it, when it comes to addiction, the answer to addiction is you just stop, right? It's uh, abstinence for eternity. That's what, what we say to heroin addicts. It's what we say to alcoholics. But when a diabetic goes to the doctor and says, oh, no, I'm, I'm diabetic. You know, what do I need to do? Uh, now that I'm on you know diabetes medication, do I need to stop eating carbohydrates? And the doctor says no. Mm-hmm. So imagine if the heroin treatment or the alcohol treatment was, you know, like you know somebody's an alcoholic and you go, hey man, just you know just get wasted on Sundays. Like that wouldn't work. <laughs> like people would be dropping like flies. Maybe I'll I'll come and up with a new about heroin cycling. You yeah, know, like five days. Yeah, <laughs> you're off. I mean, it's, on the it's, weekends you're it's on. Like what? Like. <laughs> Okay, there's addictive, and I know there's a huge argument like, well, processed foods aren't as addictive. Like, there's there's research that I, I would say heavily biased research that says that food cannot be anywhere near as addictive as, as some of these uh, recreational drugs. Uh, I, it's to me, it's like it doesn't really matter which is worse. It's still clearly addictive. That's why people are fat. So 
Have those researchers it, tried to be morbidly obese? I think those researchers have tried to enhance their bank accounts. By I would encourage them. If you, if you think it's that easy to get rid of food addiction, that's that's my field. That's where I work every yeah, day. Yeah, right. It's not that easy. And no. it's not that people are lazy. I know people are genuinely trying. It's easy to say to a fit person, like, you know what? Just cut it out and be done. Well, sometimes it takes a couple of trials and errors. Sure. Sometimes it takes a couple of cycles of trying and reading in the right. way. Right, and, and alcoholics fall and off the wagon yes, all the and time. You know, it's okay. Right. Just keep trying. Keep the interest going. Eventually, yeah. you'll get it. Don't get discouraged. Just keep going. Like, If you get a little bit off track, don't overthink it. Don't sit in your head. Just tomorrow, get right back on track. Don't try to punish yourself tomorrow for something you've done for the past two days. You're going to mm -hmm. get into this psychological drama in your own head and your yeah. life is going to be a chaos. Only thing you're going to think about is the food. So just keep going always, every single day, focus on the proper nutrition, which is the carnivore diet. And whatever got you the 20, 25 pounds down and you felt good while you were doing it, it's most likely to go going to keep working for another 20, 25. And there's going to be some <laughs> slight tweaks that you'll have to make along the way. But sorry, go ahead, keep going. I think uh, where you're going, like, uh, I, I posted a video in the X3 forum uh, from a friend of mine, Brandon Carter. Uh, he talks about how when you abstain from something, it's just gone. That's just not something you do anymore. And, and that's how we treat drugs. That's how we treat alcohol. But when it comes to processed foods, people say, oh, you know, you can have a cheat day or you can have one. And it's like, No. Because every time you have a cheat day, all you want is another cheat day. Yeah. yeah. Like, that is just, it's, it's bad logic. You just got to look at junk food as like, that's something I did when I was younger. And I don't do it anymore. And when, when you have that mindset, you, it's, nothing is torture. You're just like, it's just, somebody offers me pizza and I go, ah, it's not food. Well, like, yeah. I know somebody told you that's food, it's not. We, we, live in a, you know, we live in a weird time because... You know, all of those things, most of these horrible, awful foods, and I, you know, I will, I, I will, I don't even want to call them food. I call them food like substances. Really, I mean, you should treat them as recreational drugs, which is really what they are. I mean, we think of these ultra processed foods because they have drug like effects. And, you know, there was a time not that long ago where these things didn't exist in the world. They, you know, and so if you can just say, hey, look, these foods no longer exist in the world, you know, I mean, after it came you, in you, 1967. You, what's that? Like Pop Tart came in in 1967. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the year I was born. But I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, most of the stuff we see in the grocery store today w did not, could not exist even 100 years ago. You know, before we had massive, you know, worldwide transportation, before we had refrigeration, we had to eat in a very different way. And we didn't have a lot of these issues here. And we didn't have the food addiction issues. But because, you know, like kids growing up today, they've never, they've never known different. You know, I mean, you, you kind of, you kind of know what your grandparents ate, your parents ate, and obviously what you ate. But now we're living in a time where everyone's grandparents were were, were raised in ultra processed food. So that's, in effect, what people think is normal food. But I mean, if I were to go to rural Mongolia 75 years ago and say what's for dinner, it's going to be meat. You know, I mean, and, and that would have been a, a carnivore diet. Then would have been a normal diet. And so. The fact that they're calling you orthorexic or weird or bizarre or in a cult because you're not adapted to the modern environment, which is absolutely bizarre, crazy, is in is itself crazy. You know, to think about that people think we're strange or weird or unusual because we were like, I, I, I refuse to indulge in uh, the complete poison that's out there. You know, it, it is in any way maladaptive is, is absolutely yeah, wrong. Well, what I believe is that it's up to people like us who are interested in nutrition, human body, exercise, general health, for me specifically weight loss, like that's where, where I'm at home, to keep doing these podcasts, to keep hosting these seminars and just keep spreading the message because many people who are not interested in nutrition might be interested in something else. They might be perfect engineers. They might be perfect in some other d aspects of their lives. Just the nutrition is something they've been lacking information. And so now we weren't really interested in, in, in uh, sorry, in nutrition. We were really interested in fitness. So when we spread the message, those people can just pick up the knowledge and apply it in their life. And you know what? I also support every other eating system in terms of paleo, keto, veganism, anything. Just keep spreading the message and let people decide. Just listen to the information, and then you decide. You come up with your own outcome. 
what you think is the best for you. And you apply it, you try it, you can do anything for 30 days. You try carnivore for 30 days, you try something else for 30 days, and you're gonna gain experience. And then based on that experience, you can choose which eating system is the best for you from practical standpoint, from the health standpoint. And when it comes to autoimmune disease, I'm going to certainly say that in my opinion, there's nothing better than carnivore diet. In terms of autoimmune conditions, if you have very severe autoimmune tr conditions, in my experience with my clients, in my experience with my wife, and my own psoriasis, there was no other eating regime or eating system that helped me more. So a carnivore diet is like something I would definitely tell people with a severe autoimmune disease. However, if you're a healthy person and carnivore seems crazy to you, that's okay, just keep listening to it. Just turn on another podcast, more information, because it's gonna keep making more and more sense. And then you maybe give it a shot for two, three, four weeks, you're gonna gain practical information that you can work with. Yeah. I like that. That's perfect. Well, I mean, and we got confirmation of that at, at, at this meeting we had here in Bratislava, you know, Carnivore Conference. I cannot tell you, dozens of people came up to me with autoimmune disease thanking me that their autoim autoimmune disease is no longer part of their life. And that, that is, again, I think that's very powerful. And, and you know, it, it, as you know, uh, research needs to be done. I'm trying to help facilitate that being done. And I think that's something that, at the very least, if you know someone who's sick and suffering from this, gosh, it's such an easy way to perhaps change their life. Yes, the easy is the key thing. Like in nutrition, I do believe there's a lot more for everybody to learn for with any type of uh, eating regime, whatever it is. But one thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a concrete stance on is the autoimmune disease and carnivore. That's my 100% recommendation for anybody who suffers from autoimmune disease. Now, one last question for you guys, which I am personally very interested in. The statement, I can eat as much as I want on carnivore diet, and I will not gain body fat. Sean, what do you think? I think some people have had that experience. I don't think it's a universal experience. I think that I certainly can gain body fat if I eat enough. Some people find it very hard to overconsume on a carnivore diet because it can be very satiating, but that's not the case for everyone. Um, you know, and again, I think if I wanted to get fat on a carnivore, I would eat more food. I mean, there, there, there's a, I mean, it can be challenging. It can be hard for some people, but when you're a former fat kid, you can do it. And I, you know, and I'm, like I said, I've been over 300 pounds. I can eat enough to get fat on carnivore uh, quite easily, in fact, if I want to. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, for a lot of people, relative to their other diet, you know, they may feel like it's more effortless, but... At some point, three years in, four years in, when you're chronically adapted to this, and you decide, I just want to eat more, you, you will gain weight. You may gain body fat. So, I mean, to say that you can eat as much as you want forever is, again, it works for some people, you know, but, but certainly not for all. John, what do you think? Hey, the whole reason that some days I do eggs and ribeyes and other days I do uh, fish and and New York steaks and, and sirloins is because, uh, yeah, you can get fat by eating meat, and it's it's because of the fat, not the protein. But um, yeah, it's in nature. You don't see any animal that just keeps eating and eating and eating and eating. Uh, you know, at some point, you can. You'll see a cheetah take down a gazelle, but then if there's, after they've eaten, other gazelle can just like casually walk by. They don't want another one. I've seen that. So yeah. I, I will, I'll put a cab. I, I think you could take a human, health, a healthy human f at birth, put them on an all meat diet, and I don't think you'd ever see that person become morbidly obese. I, I think that would be probably unlikely or even impossible. But I think you take someone who is formerly obese, it's, already went down that path, already has developed addictive uh, pathology, probably has uh, screwed up satiety mechanisms to some degree. Uh, those people, I think, certainly can do it. And, and, and I've seen it. I see it repeatedly. I see people gain weight, gain body fat. I mean, again, fortunately, it's not the majority. It's usually a minority. But, uh, but yeah, I think that uh, I, I don't recall ever hearing about a morbidly obese, you know, an Eskimo, for instance. I don't remember ever hearing or seeing a morbidly obese Maasai, Maasai member. So I think, again, you know, and maybe some of its constraints on 
how much food we are able to acquire because we certainly are in a surplus environment here in the United States. You know, if you had, if you had to hunt your own food, Oh, it's gonna story. be it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be really hard. So I think there's there's some of that, you know. It's like feasting and fasting, as, as we talked about yesterday during the dinner time. That, as uh, Lawrence was saying, that feasting and fasting is pretty much a human brain by design. Like you're supposed to eat a lot and then you fast for a long time, which I do agree with. Like in the nature, yeah, you get a bigger animal, you eat a bigger portion, then another big animal is not gonna come within another three hours. So then you fast until another animal comes. Well, here's the challenge of today's society is there's another animal coming in within 30 minutes if well, you want you to. You have to digest <laughs> you know? your food before you can even really get up and chase down the other animal. Right. And there and, was this. And I, see, I, I think, Sean, you, you frame this perfectly. Like, the reason people overeat maybe completely like the, the, is... There's not a person on earth that hasn't poisoned themselves with processed food and become, you know, maybe satiated and also maybe serotonin overregulated based on the garbage food out there. Like these foods are designed to be addictive. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the people that work at Doritos, like they really want you to order another bag of Doritos after you finish your first bag of Doritos. That's their slogan. And you can't only have one. Right. Like, literally. Like, that's what they're They'll going tell for. They'll tell you. Like, right. And, I mean, I, I, I won't say that they're necessarily evil. Like, uh, you know, flavor scientists are trying to make something delicious. They, they want to succeed at their job. But that deliciousness becomes eating addiction, becomes obesity issues, becomes diabetes, becomes cancer, becomes heart disease. How about this? So you develop an unhealthy relationship with the food because in the past you used to eat some processed food and that's where you overate and you kind of got used to the feeling of being stuffed. And now where I have a problem on carnivore, here's the key sentence, you can eat as much as you want. Now, you already learned the bad behavior from the bad diet because the sugar and yeah, the seed right. oils will destroy the leptin sensitivity, the drilling will be through the roof, now you have massive sugar spikes, so you're constantly starving. There's just so much going against you. Mm. These foods just want, want you to eat over and over and over, and plus it's, it tastes good. A lot of these foods are crispy or creamy. It's just a great texture, combination of sugar and oil together. So everything is just tastes perfect in that meal. So that's where you overeat, and then you go to the carnivore, and you pretty much try to replace the same feeling of, of, of satiety with the animal products. Now, eat as much as you can um, or eat as much as you want. Now, my question is, do you know how much I want? Because I will introduce you to the panda genetics, which means that right, but see, I'm going to introduce you to that panda like, world. I think what we're saying is you don't have panda genetics. You have a panda habit. Exactly. Yeah, it's, even better. It's that, From it's today like, on, it's redefined. It's a panda habit. About. Like... Real food requires a fork and knife to eat, which means mealtime. Snack foods do not ever require a fork and knife to eat. They want it to be convenient. You can eat, you know, whatever it is, uh, why, you know, why you're, you're, like, fork and knife meal in front of while you're watching TV. No one really does that. Some people do it, but it's like that's kind of inconvenient. But you can, you can not even look and stick your hand in a bag of chips and st stick something in your mouth. It's so convenient that it ends up being, and this is part of the design of the snack food, it's like you can eat it all the time, and then people do. From today on, it's Panda Habits, and I'm going to put a pattern on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me just, there was an interesting study came out a few years back looking at a decline in cereal consumption by younger, uh, a younger po the younger members of the society and the reason for that was not that they thought cereal was bad or unhealthy. It was that cereal was not convenient enough because it required you to rinse a dish and pour milk in a bowl where they prefer to open a package, shove a little you know, bar in their mouth, and be done with it. And so that, again, this convenience aspect of food has you know, conveniently made us all sick and is destroying the population. So, yeah, the convenience aspect is... Is a real problem. You should be, you, you know, you should learn how to. You, one of the most valuable skills you can teach your 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 kids, I think, and there's several of them, but I think one of the most valuable ones is to learn how to feed themselves, how to cook for themselves, understand about 
how nutrition. As soon as my kids were able to, to read, they were they were looking at packages and labels and reading and understanding what that would, might might potentially do to them and things like how much protein is in food so they can shoot for certain targets, and and that has really. Uh, uh, I think impact them in a very positive way. I don't have fat kids. My kids are all lean and fit and athletic and very well grounded and happy and healthy. And they don't have, you know, they don't think they're the wrong gender or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's just, um, you know, I mean, we've got to, we've got to bring back, you know, that sense of, of the basic things we need to do. We've, we've, we've over convenienced our life and, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of VR world and robot world. And, and I mean, I think we're going to, we're going to pay for that in many ways. I mean, yes, it's going to provide us some benefits, but we're also going to pay an enormous toll on a societal level for that. Guys, thank you so much for today's thought. It was just, that was just amazing. Again, thanks for coming out here to Eastern Europe to speak at my seminar, and I hope these seminars will be continuous, and I'm going to make sure that we're growing our community here. Currently, we've got 20,000 people in our Carnivore Czechoslovakian community, and I'll do my best to grow it as much as I can. And when there's another seminar, I would love to see you here again. Now, I would like to thank everybody who paid attention to this podcast. And I hope we provided some knowledgeable information that you can maybe try in your life, see how you feel, and hopefully get a positive outcome. Leave a comment below when you have some questions or when you have some feedback for us. Like and subscribe. See you at the next episode. Thank you.